I think, I don't know if we spoke much about climate on our last call, but uh, I'm, I'm taking a non-mainstream perspective. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, we didn't. Um, I've heard a little bit about what you think, but I would yeah. like to hear more. Sure, I'm happy to talk yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm recording and I figured we would just kind of, you know, do a little do our little intro there and then just kind of dive into whatever. Um, I don't know what a, not sure what a great place to start is. you have any ideas? Well, um, I think your suggestion of health is a good one. I mean, there's a lot of health related stuff, which I think fits with the understanding that we're transitioning to a different version of humanity at the moment. And that's uh, changing who we are. It's changing our energetic structure. And also there are some, common ailments that are cropping up which i think might be related to the consciousness shift like mm. increased sensitivity and those sorts of things mm. Mm. um i'll ask you this before we dive into that stuff just so i don't have to ask on the podcast because i've been talking about it constantly but um do you know about internal family systems therapy have you heard of this i may know it under a different name just describe what it is exactly I think you would really like it, and uh, the guy who created it, Dick Schwartz, it's very interesting stuff. Um, basically, it's the idea that um, our psyche is comprised of multiple parts, or that yeah. our, our mind is like multiple, and yeah. then we have a capital S self. Yeah. And if we get into that self state, we can kind of communicate with these parts, and they'll kind of give us memories and yeah. and things, and we have like there's like three levels we have exiles which are like vulnerable wounded parts that we sort of exile and lock away yeah and then protective parts that kind of form around them and take on roles to protect us and then we have fire firefighter firefighters which is when our exiles get triggered those are like even more extreme protective parts that kind of step in to 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 uh take our pain away basically yeah, I, I have come across something similar years ago. Uh, a partner of mine did a, a course or a, like a program and um, they were using stuffed toys like, you know, teddy bears yeah. to represent the, the different aspects of your personality and each one, each person would kind of take a turn and they, they were using this terminology of who's driving the bus, you know, which one of your personality, sub-personalities is driving the bus at the moment. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I've been kind of diving into it, and uh, I had the guy, the creator of it on on the podcast, and that was really interesting. He, um, I've heard him talk about some pretty interesting stuff when it comes to guides fitting into this system and and various things like that, and um, even looking at like society and our culture and looking at groups and political things and just fitting all sorts of different stuff into the model. And yeah. I would be, I would be kind of curious as where, what, uh, what color you feel like that type of a thing would be in. Is that like a tier two way of looking at, uh, um, psychology? It, it, from what you've told me so far, it sounds like a, a layer six. So that's the, the last layer in the first tier. Mm. Um, because it's a, it's a communal way of looking at things because you're looking like a community of, of an internal family, I guess. Yep. And uh, it's about p different perspectives on, on your personality. From, yeah. You know, understanding that, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So yeah. basically what I was kind of, why I was asking about healing and stuff is through the internal family systems and I, I did combo in the spring and I was trying some Sananga and... I've been going through like various different shifts in my life career wise and had yeah. a, have had a really challenging situation with a personal relationship. And it kind of came to a head where through this, through specifically through the IFS, I connected with these parts that were like very vulnerable, like exiles, one of which was a baby that was just in a crib crying and nobody was coming to pick it up. And Another yeah. being just like a small boy who got like two years old, got lost um, at my grandparents' cabin and nobody knew where I was and a neighbor found me crying in the yard. 
And these were kind of things that I never, well, the baby part, obviously, I would have no recollection of. The mm. two-year-old memory, I didn't have any recollection of either, besides people telling me the story. But the memory, or like the the image of it came so naturally without, I, like, it's not a thing that I had ever thought about, like the possibility that it would have affected me or anything. Yeah. But these things came up, and then after that, it, they were really present and challenging for me and, and still are, but it's calmed down a bit, but sort of like I can like experiencing living my life through f the feeling of what that boy felt, you know, really feeling like a feeling of being lost or um, that baby thing. I can really see how it connects to like attachment issues and, codependency yeah. and feeling like if there's not a person or a thing that I can feel like I am attached to, there's like a real uncomfortability with like the sovereignty and independence of like really leading my own life and making my own decisions. And some of the things I've started to do to kind of try to work through the stuff is like acupuncture for one and um, just like hypnosis inner child healing meditations and things like that yeah. and so i was just kind of curious about what uh if you're hearing or seeing more things like this I, i've been seeing a lot of people talking about inner child and reparenting and people sort of connecting with these inner children parts of themselves and so yeah i thought it'd be interesting to get your whole uh take on all that yeah sure yeah you know it can certainly map it onto the spiral layers yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what do you think? Uh, okay. So, yeah. Um, if you think about the the Claire Graves model of personal development through these little different layers of consciousness as being a journey, and we start out as a newborn at layer one, which is basically like a you know basic survival kind of existence, uh, and then we grow through the layers, and as we grow whatever age we're at you know we're going to be centered around one particular layer and so any experience we have which remains unresolved for us emotionally in particular um even when you know, later in life like at, you know at our present age when we go through a healing process and we sort of take our attention back to that experience the the recorded memories through the lens of this relatively simplistic uh, perspective on life that you know that's tied to whatever our dominant worldview was at the time so you can absolutely map these kinds of past experiences uh, you know some people might call them a, a psychological pathology something that that needs to be healed uh, and uh, and and I think this is the origin of the the inner child concept in psychology is because this memory was embedded and preserved in our in our body at a particular age when we go back and revisit the memory we're revisiting it and looking through the eyes of you know whatever age we were at at the time yeah and at this time in history when so many people are going through this transition beyond the the fifth scientific industrial way of being human to what's next the sixth layer in particular which is very humanistic very network centric um, there's this strong desire to want to go back and revisit all of those things, whatever we've got left behind that needs yeah. to be. Yeah. And, and a lot of people are feeling that. And it's essential because the next step beyond this current emerging paradigm is this momentous leap in, con in uh, consciousness. You know, it's a massive quantum leap. And you need to have a solid foundation to make that leap. So if you've still got things unresolved in your past, you can't quite get the traction to make the big leap, if that makes sense. It does. So that's what's so important at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what it feels like to me. I've, I've even found myself uh, just naturally wanting to reach out to family members and dig into what our childhood environment was like. And you know what I mean? Talking yeah. about history and even my parents' childhood and their history and just sort of like getting a better picture and understanding of like how I got to where I am right now and you know, how their, my parents and their parents and stuff like exist in me and how to kind of integrate all of that. Um, so what, I mean, have you experienced stuff like that in your 
life and what kind of things have helped you had helped you like get work through those things and integrate that stuff i have i i had a a very traumatic experience when i was 15 months old and i had no memory of it at all the only reason i knew about it was because my my mother had told me the story and uh my parents were painting the house and had left a someone had left a, a tin of uh, turpentine, you know, like a jam, old fashioned jam tin, mm -hmm. with a paintbrush probably sitting in it, mm -hmm. lying around, probably white paint, so it looked like milk to a little kid. And I've just gone up and, and drunk some of it, which made me very, very sick and I almost died. Uh, and um, when I went through my biggest um, emotional crisis that I've had, which was actually my transition from first tier into second tier consciousness, uh, and it was fueled by post-traumatic stress from my work in the army and in emergency services as a helicopter pilot. Um, I went through intensive conventional therapy. Uh, I went on antidepressants and I had one-on-one -on -one counseling uh, starting at twice a week, you know, which went on for a year and a half. And then I went through a, a fairly intensive group therapy program as well. And that incident from my childhood didn't even come up in discussion. You know, it wasn't prominently in my mind at all, and I had no memory of it anyway. Uh, and it was only years later when I started doing psychedelic assisted therapy that I started recovering some memory. And I, I eventually did recall some uh, visions and experiences. And I went through, over a period of some years, I actually went through re-experiencing that poisoning about three three or four times probably during mm -hmm. a psychedelic journey where I could feel I was feeling like I couldn't breathe and that gave me really deep insights into what happened at the time uh, I, I did recover memories and uh, it also helped me understand and, and integrate the experience and how it might be impacting me later in life you know yeah 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 so that's something that I haven't done at this point any psychedelic assisted therapy it's definitely something that's been on my mind for something that could you know be important at some point it doesn't hasn't um haven't been exactly called to it yet or hasn't come up for me personally like uh in a in a way that's felt felt uh safe at this point but um i'm wondering was there any like you know having had emotional crises and stuff i can relate to that throughout my life i've had a couple different times where I've had big sort of emotional crises with a lot of really intense anxiety and panic attacks and depression and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Was that, Did that cause any trepidation from feeling comfortable diving into the psychedelic therapy world? Like, because I know at, on one hand, people talk a lot about psychedelics being so healing for stuff like that. But on the other hand, you always get the little disclaimer of like, well, it's not for everybody, though. And, you know, it kind of implants that little yeah. fear fear in the back of your mind that's like, well, maybe I'm not the person who should be doing stuff like that, you know. Yeah. And I think that's healthy because it can be very intensive, you know. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend anybody approach psychedelic therapy unless they really honestly feel like they're ready for it and they feel like it's right for them to be doing. Mm hmm um, I, I kind of got spared the initial anxiety because the first time I tried ayahuasca, which was my first psychedelic experience, I didn't even know that it was a medicine. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I really approached it from an interest in consciousness. Mm. And, and, you know, I, I'd been meditating for seven years and I had some advice from people I trusted that these medicines were, were good tools for personal development and opening consciousness. I really didn't approach it from a healing point of view, uh, and then the healing came as a as a sort of fortunate side effect, you know, that I discovered after the fact. So um, by the time I got to re-experiencing that ex that childhood uh, event, I was well into you know working with psychedelic medicines, and um, yeah, it wasn't really a question that I had to face. You know, sure. I, I, didn't come from that angle of okay there's probably something deep that I need to delve into here should I but, yeah, I just found myself in the pool already <laughs> it does sound like you lucked out then I kind of wish I could erase all my uh, knowledge and 
learning about psychedelic stuff and just dethroned into an experience like that in some ways. But yeah. um, I have I had an MDMA session in a therapeutic setting, not straight up therapy, but you know, with friends in a yeah, like with the intention of it being a therapeutic thing. And that was a while. That wasn't well. I was going through any of this type of stuff though uh, but it was a definitely a positive experience um and i and i also have uh experienced dmt which was a very positive experience but it's such a short experience i'm sure it has healing properties i would imagine but it's not really anything where i feel like you can really get in and oh uh, yeah uh, smoking dmt it tends to be intense and fast and mm -hmm don't always recall everything that goes on. So it's, it's not ideally suited for therapy, but, uh, you know, ayahuasca form where you get a, an extended experience that's manageable, um, you know, that's better. But again, you need to make sure that you're doing it with the right people who know what they're doing and you, that you, you're going to be well supported. Um, the obvious tricky thing at the moment is that in most countries, psychedelic assisted therapy is illegal. So, you, you know, it's hard to know the quality that you're going to receive, you know, in terms of care and those sorts of things, it's, mm -hmm. it's very tricky, yeah. MDMA is a good introduction, though. Like, if you've got an opportunity to do it, you know that it's safe. Um, it's prob it's a good uh, entry point. Mm -hmm. that, kind of yeah. that helped you quite a bit with your PTSD stuff? It did, yeah. Um, out of all the treatment that I've had for PTSD, I can honestly say that my very first MDMA session was the most impactful you know i got most more healing benefit from that single uh, session than anything else that i had done so it seems to me that um pretty much everybody is going to have some type of you know maybe not as intense as drinking turpentine but i think every yeah. single person has some type of uh trauma from their childhood whether it just be they cried for an extended period of time and their parents couldn't get them or we're trying the Ferber method or, or, you know, they got lost at Walmart or whatever it is. Like ch little kids are so sensitive and babies are so sensitive and just yeah. wired. It seems like, uh, everybody is going to have some sort of neural pathway that was formed due to some little bit of trauma. So, you know, is this going to be a mass scale thing where, you know, millions of people are going to be needing to really like get some help to work through this stuff? I, I think it is. Um, the transition is tied to the complexity of life conditions and not everybody is going to need to go through this transition because they, their life conditions might not um, trigger that actual mm. transition into second tier. But uh, I, I think we are going to see a lot of people globally going through what we're talking about. Yeah. And, mm. you know, like we're, we're kind of the pathfinders. So there's a mm. whole bunch of people who've got to go through this yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it, I just, sorry, I was just going to mention also um, Stanislav Grof, who you may have heard of, is a great, was a great pioneer in uh, psychedelic therapy, and he talks about the trauma of birth mm. being a significant thing, just coming out of a womb into you know a world that's very, very different than being inside the womb and the shock of experiencing that, and also the the process of birthing that you know has been prevalent during the scientific industrial era, which hasn't been all that nurturing. Yes. Uh, and, and he says, you know, every single person who's alive carries that birth trauma. Yeah, That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I know for me, the, the biggest thing with my DMT experience was how much it felt like just going home and like such a peaceful, you know, return to almost like a womb-like, you know, state of just bliss and comfort. And yeah. coming back from that wasn't traumatic at all. I mean, it, you know, it was pleasant because it was a, yeah, you know, what I had just experienced, but I can understand how, you know, being in that intimate connection with another being that's feeding you and sending you everything you need just automatically to being pushed out into some scary world where you have to like cry to get your needs met and stuff could be pretty, pretty overwhelming. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it seems like to me with, uh, you know, what I've been feeling personally and just getting into like the IFS stuff and even Gabor Mate's work and, and things like that. It seems like even people who aren't recognizing that they're de having to deal with inner child stuff, just the rise of anxiety and depression and things like that are ultimately just, you know, 
introductory symptoms or are there symptoms that are coming up because there's those underlying things does that make sense like it does make sense yeah and you know we're living in a world that's in transition at the moment and our old social systems that were designed during the scientific industrial era they're they're coping less and less as the world becomes more connected and more complex so there are very few people who aren't feeling that tension associated with uh, old systems not coping um, you know having to find new way to do things do things and, and also um, the disconnectedness that's resulted from the scientific industrial era even our technology that's supposed to connect us doesn't really connect us physically it just connects us virtually um, yeah I, yeah i think that's a, another aspect of what i've been going through is like it's you know, as if the inner child whole business and all that wasn't enough there's this aspect of like it seems like this could be worked through it in a in an easier way if there was that sense of community and support and like a ceremony type of ritualistic healing things were worked into our culture in a natural way but i kind of find myself on an island to a certain extent and almost with a lot of people who can't necessarily relate or hold space where if i was to say just like start bawling because i'm connecting with my inner child like I'm going to have to end up almost holding space for them because they're going to start to feel so bad for and try yeah. to help me that it's like, no, it's okay. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing of, it's like, how do you find that, that community and get those types of support right now? It's kind of a, it's a difficult thing. I feel like. It is tricky. Yeah. I mean, I'm fortunate that I live here in, in Byron Shire near Byron Bay, Australia, because this is like a little bubble of the future here, <laughs> you know, and, and there've been people doing that kind of work here for, for decades now. Uh, and so it's easy to access and there's a lot of stuff out there, but, you know, I understand that people, some people are living in places where it's not a common thing. So I guess you just need to go traveling. Uh, to, to find that, but you know, there, there is a very strong theme with this emerging paradigm of healing in community. You know, it's all about healing yourself and going back through your, your history, as we said, but doing that in the company of others and having that sort of intimate support. It's a very, very strong theme. Yeah. Um, so as far as uh, different types of healing modalities that you know of and that are kind of um i mean like acupuncture i know is something you are interested in particularly probably more of the esoteric acupuncture but have you um done much of the standard chinese medicine acupuncture as well or i have done a bit yeah so i've been studying a, a taoist martial and healing art for about 21 years now uh, and it's built around the Chinese medicine understanding of the body and, and the body's energy. So is that uh, qigong? It, yeah, it's a type of qigong. Yeah, it's, okay. the the style that I do is called tai chi chuan, which is okay. a, an old traditional kung fu system. Uh, and it, it has a it's it's also a healing system as well. And as you start to practice it, you, and you get used to feeling your own energy, it becomes a health healing a, a self healing process. Um, I could have said health ceiling, that sounds good too, <laughs> uh, where you, you, know, you learn how to move and balance your own energy. And then if you practice long enough, it turns into a medical thing where you can help other people balance their energy and heal with that energy. Uh, and uh, it can involve uh, acupuncture using needles if you're a qualified uh, Chinese medicine doctor. And I, I've got a, a really good uh, friend and colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Stephen Booth, uh, that I work closely with, who I met through our Kung Fu school. He's an old Kung mm -hmm. Fu buddy, and he's a he's studied to be a doctor of Chinese medicine. And so uh, when I'm hanging out with him, you know, sometimes he'll use needles and things. But you can also do it with uh, just straight energy work, stimulating acupuncture points with uh, just with your fingers. You know, if you're an energy worker, mm -hmm. or uh, or crystal tools and those sorts of things, and. We've been working, Steve and I, for uh, almost two years now um, together on a, a body of work uh, that was put together by a, a Japanese-American guy called Dr. Mikio Sankey. He's based in LA, and it is called Esoteric Acupuncture, as you said. In fact, I've got one of these books right here just to, to hold up um, so you can see it. 
And um, he's no slouch. He's got a, I think he's got a couple of PhDs in Chinese medicine, Mikio Sankey, and he's written seven books now on this system, which is really an advanced healing system based on the Chinese uh, understanding of medicine. And it's looking at how our body's subtle energy structure in particular changes as we uh, go through the latter stages of first year consciousness and transition into second year consciousness. And um, my my buddy, Stephen Booth, is actually trained with Mikio Sankey and runs workshops here on it. Uh, and it's been really, really interesting as I was, over the years, as I was doing more and more uh, work with psychedelics uh, and also practicing my Kung Fu, I became aware of changes in my own energy structure, but I really didn't understand what was going on. You know, sometimes I'd be sitting in ceremony, I'd feel kind of different energetic feelings in my body sometimes I, i'd feel you know energy streams coming out of my head and that kind of thing but and i used to sit there and think gee i wish i had you know a map or some scientist who could come stick a, an instrument on me and tell me what's going on <laughs> uh, and it was only just almost two years ago now that i got introduced to this by uh, stephen booth and it's um it's it's a really interesting map basically of the future of human energetic structure and i'll, I'll just hold up one image here which will give you a rough idea of the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Mm. Can you see that? Okay. Yep. So basically, this is not a complete map, but this is one uh, field called the Wei Chi field, which is subtle energy structure made up of three-dimensional shapes, uh, triangular shapes, so basically tetrahedrons. And it's laid over the top of the chakra system and the energy meridian system, and the point references on there are actually acupuncture points. So the edges of the geometry uh, correlate with uh, acupuncture points on the body. Mm. And it, it's, it seems to be very dynamic uh, in that the shapes can also spin. So then it's not static, but I, I guess the chakras also spin, so that makes sense as well. Um, so, yeah, we've been doing some quite interesting uh, exploration work with these new energetic structures and also um, using them for uh, for simple healing processes like there that was a very complex pattern that I showed you but there are some very simple patterns uh, one of which I used at a, a, t a public talk I did just a few weekends ago at a herbalist festival mm. um, which uh, can be extremely useful particularly if people are sort of in the the range of moving through that final layer of first year consciousness, uh, yeah, first year consciousness, like the, the sixth layer, which is that humanistic, network centric mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, anywhere from there and and through transitioning into second tier, this can be a really useful tool for advanced healing work. Yeah. So, um, to tie it into what we were talking about earlier, do you feel like uh, something like that is like a finer healing type a more subtle type of healing like where do you see this sort of inner child work as more of like a gross or dense kind of a healing if that makes sense it does make sense um i think it's very complex that's probably oversimplifying it a little bit sure but if you think of the layers of consciousness uh which just to remind anyone who, who may not have heard me talk about them before they they're nested inside each other. So if that's the first layer of consciousness, you know, when we're a baby, then the next layer gets wrapped over the top of it and the next yeah. one is wrapped over the top of that. So it's kind of like those Russian dolls that are nested inside each other. And consequently, wherever we're at now, we've got this nest of different layers of consciousness uh, to make up our whole being. And if we have to go revisit one of those earlier stages, then it's going to be at a different operating frequency uh, assuming that the the most recent layer of consciousness that you've grown into is the uh, finest or, or highest frequency, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, so some so it is a matter of like matching the healing tool to fit with whatever healing you need done. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably in terms of fine versus coarse, um, the most significant situations I've come across are where people have had traumatic experiences and they've. Uh, ended up with a, like an energetic armoring and an emotional armoring that they've put over themselves to protect, you know, this sensitive part of themselves. And sometimes that armoring needs a, a bit of uh, raw and coarse 
treatment to break it away, you know. Mm. And so you, you see people doing things like, for example, the Wim Hof method is a good example of that, of a relatively coarse treatment, which involves putting stress on the body to try and bust through this armoring. Yeah, yep. yeah I feel like that's kind of a bit of what I did unconsciously. I didn't really know I was doing that, but that's yeah. sort of what I did to like kind of break uh, this part open you know, break the protective layer open and kind of, and I've never been a super, super rigid, you know, protected guy. So it's a little bit easier, I think, for me to, to bust that shell open. So, yeah. you know, if a person has that, is in touch with that sensitive part, do you feel like something like esoteric acupuncture? And I'm not looking for a specific prescription for myself here. I'm just more curious than anything. Um, do you feel like something like that, um, can do healing of like say the inner child work or help to heal those earlier layers or is it more um or do you see it differently than that i think it can uh healing modalities are a bit like hobbies and sports though mm. i think people need to really work with their own feelings and intuition around what they're drawn to do mm-hmm um, you know, not everybody wants to do yoga. Not everybody wants to play golf. Yeah, uh, there are good reasons for that. So it's impossible to sort of say this modality is best because it really depends who you are and what you need and what you're drawn to do. You know? Sure. Yeah, yeah I think I, I would. The, the simple answer to your question is yes. I think it can help. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and that's kind of what I was more looking at is because for me it's kind of like and I'm sure that other people could relate to this is like, I'm kind of trying to ask myself sometimes like, okay, acupuncture in general, I've been doing it for a little while now and it's definitely helping me like feel better. It seems to be just balancing energy, moving energy. Like it just, it sometimes makes me feel, um, weird, I guess is a simple way to put it because it's like, it opens things up to where I feel less tension and less stress and and anxiety, but also there's it's like a blank slate kind of a feeling. Like my old structures of personality are just sort of uh, pushed into the background a little bit, and it's sort of like, well, what do I do now? Like, who am I now? <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, and that's, that's a sign of progress. You know, in transformational change, we go from one idea of who we are through the change process and typically once we get deep in that change process we don't know who we are because mm. we're in between you know and then we we integrate what's happened and form a new understanding of who we are which feels different yeah yeah and i've thought a lot about uh, some of the stuff that you've talked about with the change process because i recognize it so much and just what i'm going through like trying a lot of different things you know and um just sort of that feeling of of reminding myself like a lot of not a lot of stuff feels like really right at the moment, you know, mm. and I just try to remind myself hey, it's not supposed to feel right right now necessarily. That's kind of the yeah. whole point, right? <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's that it's moving from stability into basically feeling unstable and, and uncertain and then that's just part of the journey. I think that's what makes it so difficult for a lot of people is they've never been taught about that journey that we have to take when we, we heal ourselves. You know, that takes us into this kind of uh, nowhere land, you know, where we, we're in between one thing and another thing. We literally don't know who we are or where we are or what's, you know, where our anchor points are in life. And, and that's normal. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we should we should get taught about this kind of stuff in school. Yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. Because... I find that there is a, a part of me that can, or maybe it's just the more of the capital S self when I tap into just, um, just a simple being, like you can kind of go through these times with all the uncertainty and still just sort of have at least some sense of sort of the eye in the middle of the storm. Yeah. But yeah, it's that... not something like you said that we've ever really were told about or helped to kind of find that place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, depending on what kind of healing modality you're doing, um, meditation can be really useful because uh, if you're a long term meditator, you, you get accustomed to kind of sitting in that witness space and allowing things to happen, you know, and, and it's good if you, you're able to do that. Yeah. yeah so um, 
what other types of uh, healing stuff have you been either interested in or hearing about? Anything jump into mind? Um, I guess uh, mostly I have been working around psychoactive healing tools like psychedelics and, and also energy work mm -hmm. uh, along the lines of, of Reiki, which is probably something most people would, would understand. Uh, but my energy work tradition has come out of the Taoist martial arts world, so I've sort of come from that angle uh, and with an understanding of the, the Chinese medicine map of energy in the body. So I've mostly been in, immersed in those modalities, energy work, uh, also advanced energy work using light um, and, uh, and then things that impact the consciousness and change our consciousness and also impact our subtle body. So some of the uh, dissociative medicines which are used in psychoactive therapy uh, like um, anesthetics like ketamine, uh, they can in very, very tiny, tiny doses lift the subtle body slightly and change our awareness of the subtle body which can be quite useful for healing but uh, you've really got to know what you're doing yeah mm, interesting um i think i've a might have asked you this before but you know you said the layers of consciousness are are you know nested like you said um yeah. when a person has sort of a primary layer that they exist at you know they're still sort of obviously they have the layers before but they also kind of potentially have um layers they're, they have some percentage of like the next layer of consciousness sort of at the same time like yeah. if someone's maybe transitioning from five to six primarily but they have some seven mixed in or yeah, the, the general feeling amongst uh, you know, people who study the kind of stuff that I've studied is that we're usually spread across about three layers most of the time. So mm -hmm. one of those layers will be our central dominant worldview. Uh, we'll be maybe just a little bit creeping into the next layer above that, you know, and there'll be a bit of this left behind in the previous layer as well. That, that seems to be a pretty average thing. And then with the previous layers, all of them are available and it's a dynamics process so if there's a sudden change in our life conditions then we can easily move down the spiral to one of our previous layers and operate from there if we need to mm -hmm. but uh, we've got to grow into the higher layers so we can't necessarily access them unless we have started to grow into them yeah sure but we maybe have um there's some some uh insight maybe from those layers starting to come to us or something like that potentially yeah yeah i mean if you you know if you kind of imagine a a template that's this wide that encompasses one layer in the middle and you know half a step into the next layer on this side and half a step behind there and that's kind of slowly moving um you know along the spiral so we're we're always if we're healthy and open and, and growing then we're always just slowly creeping into whatever's next yeah in a way it almost feels like the carrot hanging in front of the the head or something because i sort of felt like you know from my perspective i wasn't thinking like oh i'm at a level seven but i could sense like there are certain things in the description of seven that i could relate to and i feel like i can understand things in like a systematic integral kind of way but yeah. sort of pushing towards that i think is almost feels like what sort of pulled me back or um forced me to kind of go back to these earlier layers or something and feeling yeah. like oh i didn't realize that i was actually had the all these things stuck down here you know yeah yeah you know an, another way to look at it from that uh esoteric acupuncture angle if you imagine that this extra subtle energy geometry is uh what they call the light body it's essentially light body structure if, if parts of the light body then it's it's quite literally shining more light in, in your system right 
in a multiple dimensional multiple multiple dimensional way. Um, Sorry, so I mean, the more you start to activate, the more uh, is lagging behind is going to stand short. Sure. <laughs> Sorry, one second, Steve. Can you uh, can you start that one over? I got a really yeah. crazy glitch, and but that sounded really interesting. So, the uh, yeah. the light the light body. Yeah. So to to talk about this from the point of view of activating the light body, and uh, this is something that there isn't a lot of good information. Uh, out there about just yet, but you know the esoteric acupuncture material I'm finding really valuable in starting to understand what the light body is and to to map it. Um, and as we start to activate aspects of our light body, anything that needs healing becomes more illuminated. You know, it's it's kind of like opening a dark room and shining a torch in there, right? And you're going to have a much clearer idea of what's in there when you shine that torch. Mm -hmm. And so when we start to activate our light body, it will literally accelerate our healing process and it will bring up very, very quickly anything that needs to be attended to in terms of leftover pathologies from previous layers of consciousness, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Interesting. So where do you see... Um sort of the uh global state right now um and the shift from five to six is the primary shift that you feel we're underway right now yeah from the scientific industrial to this humanistic network centric um i think that we are descending towards the chaos phase of the shift at the moment and as best as i can figure I'm, I'm seeing around about 2032 as being a global turning point. So between now and 2032, I think we're going to see a lot of increasing tension, a lot of uh, old design systems collapsing, uh, economic systems, educational systems, health systems, those sorts of things. And simultaneously, we're going to see the early stage emergence of the next paradigm systems. So. Um, Cryptocurrency and blockchain, I think, is a good example of that. You know, it's very, very early stage, but it's there. We, we know that it's there. And some people are saying, you know, it's likely to take over from our current economic systems. I think that's probably the case, too. Um, and maybe not in its current form, but, it, you know, it will develop as time goes by as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're going to see that right across the board. So it's going to be a really interesting time. There's going to be some amazing breakthroughs in technology and new systems and thinking. Uh, and at the same time, there's also going to be a lot of collapse going on. And I think the, the key thing for us is to start to be able to recognize those next level systems, next level thinking, uh, and put our energy into building those. That's a really important thing mm. because the sooner, sooner we can get those new systems up and running, the smoother the transition is going to be. But uh, I, I quite confidently feel that uh, we haven't really entered into the chaos phase yet. You know, where we've got early signs of it, like look how much civil unrest is cropping up around the world. Um, what's happening in Hong Kong, is, you know, is one example. And uh, there's going to be more of that to come. Yeah, so uh, in terms of the, the sort of uh, roller coaster of change, you know, uh, we've come from stable scientific industrial we're sliding downhill now towards the chaos at the bottom of the, the dip and we're not there yet uh, but we can start to see little bits of it cropping up and then things need to bottom out and then we need to sort of break through come out the other side to that new stability which i'm feeling is is probably going to be sometime after 2032 so mm. uh, you know there, there's quite a ride yet to come um, um. It had, by the time you'd gotten into this uh, stuff, had you already kind of feel like you worked through a lot of stuff that would um, have triggered fears for you? Or, or was there any sort of anxieties or fears when you first started getting into this stuff and thinking like, man, this is, this is going to be quite the, uh, quite the wild ride here? Yeah, absolutely there was, you know, particularly because I didn't have any time frame for it back then. And uh it really started to come to my attention in the late 90s. And at that time, I was living in the country, uh, working as a rescue helicopter pilot and um, was married at the time. And my wife and I actually started, we set up a permaculture garden and started to 
you know, get towards being having some level of independence around food supply and those sorts of things because we had no idea how soon this might happen. Mm-hmm. And then um, I, I discovered Claire Graves' work the same year that I had my breakdown, mm-hmm. which really was my breakdown and breakthrough to second tier. So as I was going through that, you know, what is probably the, the biggest uh, breakdown and breakthrough that we have to, to go through, uh, which is from first tier to second tier, um, I had in the back of my mind Claire Graves' map, you know, so that was re- quite reassuring that I, because I could see myself falling apart in quite a bad way and it wasn't easy by any means, um, but I knew that it was a process and I knew that I was going to come out the other side of it. So I found that really helpful. Was that and, in and of itself sort of a uh, psychedelic experience in a way? Just the, uh, just the feeling of sort of... Uh, the breakdown of your identity sort of and sometimes living from that space of just sort of, you know, uh, um, like we were saying before, like that sort of blank slate kind of perspective of just not really kind of feeling like you know who you are. And, oh, yeah, de- definitely. I-, I went through all that kind of stuff, you know, that that was before I discovered psychedelic medicines. So yeah. I didn't have the the benefit of using those at all but uh i had i'd been meditating for i think seven no been meditating for about four years by that time so you know i had some of that capacity to kind of sit back and witness what was going on for myself yeah, yeah. um yeah because i think a lot of people probably and myself included i'm i'm not like um panicking about it on a regular basis but it is it you know <laughs> It's a, it can be a scary thought sometimes to think about the major structures that we've relied on for, I mean, our whole lives totally collapsing, you know, as far as the financial system, political system, you know, maybe food being scarce and unpredictable, weather being very intense. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, uh, kind of an it can be an intense thing to to uh think about but it feels 100 percent real i mean it's just a matter of time as, as far as i'm concerned yeah and you know the the antidote or the solution is uh for us to move into our next layer of the consciousness which is very much network centric you know and we're shifting from the individually oriented scientific industrial era to a communally oriented paradigm this, this sixth layer in particular. Uh, and so it's all about regenerating community, building that close, intimate network uh, of supporters, you know, and working together to to resolve the kinds of issues that we're facing at the moment um, and, and building uh, resilient communities that can work together to overcome any obstacles that get thrown our way. Uh, and it, it's also interesting to ponder that it's not just us the humans that are going through this transition, but the whole planetary system, and in fact, our whole solar system at the moment is going through a similar transition, which is, it's all part of the same transition, basically. Do you um, pay attention to astrology? I do, yeah. Yeah. Is that, uh, are, is there stuff going on in astrology that you notice that's fitting into all of this? Tons of it, yeah. I would assume. I, 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 I'm not an astrologer, so I can't really speak too much to it, but I have a lot of friends around me who are quite good astrologers. And, and yeah, it's all written there in the astrology. You know, you can mm-hmm. trace back to the early waves of this paradigm shift back in the 60s and prior to that. You know, there were planetary alignments happening back then, which are reoccurring now. Uh, and the same energies are being, being uh, brought forward, you know, from those influences. Mm-hmm. And, um, Astrology is like anything, like you can get bad astrology and, and amazingly sophisticated astrology depending on who's doing the astrology. Mm-hmm. I've, I've come to see it as quite a sophisticated science when it's done well in terms of understanding the influences at play. Yeah. Yeah. So the the shift to communal-based stuff, I've been thinking, um, it seems there's an obvious desire, people starting to feel more like they need community and want more connection and intimacy and stuff. Um, but also, do you think what really kind of um, spurs uh, that push for community is going to be somewhat by necessity as well, just this, in terms of, you know, if things, when things do start to collapse, we're just going to kind of need people and to help us and, and all of that? 
I, I do think that's going to be the case because uh, ultimately the the shift is an evolutionary adaptation, right? Uh, and it's happening because of our life conditions and how they're changing. So there's a natural evolutionary process at play, which is leading us to want to rebuild local communities uh, and uh, resource things locally. And, and, and that is a natural adaptation, you know, just in the same way that uh, that different organisms have adapted physically over thousands of years to fit better with their environment. This is the same thing happening to us, but on a more subtle level. Mm. What yeah. um, are you still doing the permaculture gardening and stuff like that or? Not right now, but I, I'm keen, actually, uh, I'm keen to, to start doing it again in the near future, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, what type of stuff from Tier 2 do you identify going on right now? Uh, there's, there's still not a lot really obviously going on, and it's, it's very hard to spot anyway because someone who's operating from the second tier has the capacity to kind of shape shift and adapt to whatever their life conditions you know call for so uh, you can get people who have second tier capacity who are just like mixed in with the crowd and doing what the crowd's doing um, and it can you know it's it's not something that stands out obviously in the general public but uh, you we we could expect people uh, operating from second tier at the moment to uh, be keeping a very close eye on the, the global picture and the potential convergence of many of the different challenges that we're facing at the moment and trying to figure out how we're going to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, the early signs are there. You know, I was just this morning uh, listening to a podcast talking about particularly the agricultural situation in the US at the moment. Uh, you guys had a very cold winter and a reduced growing season last winter, and now you're getting early cold this winter. Um, and the implications of that are stacking up. You know, there are there were some uh, food shortages in the U.S. this year. I think uh, peas and, and other stuff. You know, simply because of the not only the the late uh, end to winter, but then the wet from the, the snow melt, which made, you know, made it difficult to get into the fields and plant, and so the growing season was reduced. And then uh, the use of uh, propane gas to help dry crops out has just recently created a propane gas shortage in the Midwestern mm. US. And so it's those overlapping intersection, intersecting things that we really need to, to watch out for, because they're the things that are gonna catch us out. You know? So it's not just about interruption to agriculture, but it's also implications for food supply and now gas supply. Uh, and I understand that there's not a propane gas shortage in the US, but it's just locally an issue in the Midwest because everybody's using more gas than they used to before. And so um, second tier is very much about pattern recognition and it has this multi-dimensional capacity to look at multiple patterns at once and start to get a sense of how those patterns are going to interact, and what the outcome is going to be. And so at a global scale, I mean, that's just a very small, relatively local example. On a global scale, we've got lots and lots of different issues that are arising that are going to, and some are already overlapping, and the consequences are going to be so complex that most people are just going to be blindsided, you know, yeah. when the problems arise. And, and so it's the, the people with second tier capacity who right now are kind of awake to this and they're seeing it. And, uh, and I, I expect that many of them would be taking steps to organize uh, and be able to help, you know, whatever response um, is called for, you know, once these things really start to stack up. And, and it's this, this is all part of this evolutionary tension that's building, that's actually pushing us to change our behavior, to change our values, to change our worldview, uh, and move into being, you know, the next version of, of human. Mm. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, because, I mean, I'm just relating it to sort of what I'm going through right now, and it's just interesting how you can kind of, you can feel what that process is like, and imagining it on a global scale is pretty, pretty wild to think about. Um, because I think one of the biggest things that I've found is that sometimes you just literally don't know, you know that something needs to change, but you just don't know what. That's um, right. And one yeah. of the ways I've kind of found is, um, 
anytime I have just a slightest feeling of like, I just feel like I should do acupuncture or something. I'll just like, all right, I'll try that, you know, and, and I've always been a little bit of a, a shy person or have like a, a, have my comfort zone and, you know, haven't been really like extroverted, go out and meet people and try new things and stuff. So just simply kind of trying to go with those little pings and just yeah. try different things and connect with people and it might not be some big you know monumental fix right away but it seems like it starts the process of just connecting new pathways and kind of getting things moving and do you see like do you feel like that's part of what we're going to go through as well just kind of people kind of trying yeah. things out <clears throat> absolutely that uh movement towards you know listening to and, and acting on your intuition is a key aspect of the first tier second tier transition so uh, it comes with some difficulties in that we have to figure out what internal messages are driven by fear for example uh, as opposed to a true intuition and that's a key aspect of you know what you're talking about and it's it's really good to hear that you're doing that because uh by listening to those messages and acting on them, you're also training yourself uh, to understand better which messages are the ones that need to be listened to, right? Mm. And which messages maybe just are uh, some fear coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, and those things will feel differently in the body. So this is a, one of the key learnings really between first tier and second tier consciousness is tapping into and knowing how to, to act on our deep intuition. Uh, and essentially what we're doing there is we're tapping into the quantum field of, of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. uh, all the answers to everything are, are just sitting in that quantum field and we can pluck them out. They'll be made available to us when, when we need to know them. But it's a process of learning how to listen and, and how to know which ones uh, are the right messages to act on. Yeah. 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 It's tricky. At least it is for me right now. But yeah. But um, it's funny because the things that, it almost seems like life is just trying to make things easier for you, but you're so used to <laughs> the way things have been that you're like purposefully hanging on and making things harder for yourself. When the whole so while it's like some current is just be like, just go yeah. here. It's going to be better. You know, that is so true. So much of it is just about stepping out of the way, you know, mm -hmm. really, it really is. Yeah. But for me, I've noticed, I think, that the, my resistance to doing that is there's some part of you that has to almost die in a way. Or, like, you're leaving behind an identity that you've thought to be who you are. And so that, for me, is really uncomfortable because it's like, okay, if I'm not that, like, I don't know what I am. And that's a really scary feeling, you know, because I've existed this way for so long. You know, maybe even like the parts that you've had since you were a, a baby or a small child. So it's like that's all you know of yourself is a lot of the parts around it have changed, but that that little bit has stayed the same and it's what protected you when you were so vulnerable. And so it's like for that to change feels like very intense, you know. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. And it's part of the reason why we're being drawn to, to do healing work in groups now is mm – -hmm. Hearing other people say what you just said, you know, it can be really, really helpful for someone who's in the middle of that, but they don't know that everyone else is going through it as well, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it can be really very reassuring to hear other people talk about their processes. And, uh, and you know, that's one of the key ways of learning what we need to learn to make this transition from first tier to second tier right now. Is, um, is to work together in groups to talk to each other about our internal processes and to learn from that. That's good to hear because I've been trying to um, put myself out there with this stuff a little bit more. It feels a little bit weird because, you know, just historically people sharing about really intense struggles. It's like, oh, is, are, is everybody OK? Or, you know what I mean? It's just like, yeah, yeah. Are, am I sharing too much? Should I have better boundaries? There's all these different, you know, potential concerns. Or what if my landlord reads this or, you know what I mean? Whatever. Totally. Yeah. social media be so exposed but having done it a little bit and just some of the stuff that i've gone into on on the podcast like i have gotten some people who've responded who've really related to things and it's helped me connect with some more people who uh seem to be going through similar things and you know 
again, it's not something that immediately is going to flip the switch and make everything better, but it does help to kind of feel like you're part of, you know, there's other people around you that are kind of traversing the same territory with you. It does too, yeah. And a really interesting way of navigating in this space is to just become aware of what's being driven by fear mm. because uh, fear is arising from that part of you that doesn't want to change, you know, that part of you that's still kind of embedded in old ways of doing things. And there's so much fear in the social media at the moment and in media generally. I mean, the, the mainstream media is driven by fear, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the scary things are happening today. Let, let's tell you about it. Yeah. Um, and we, if you can start to notice your own fears and when they come up and and uh, be aware if you know, you're know you being motivated by fear rather than by insight or deep intuition, and that, that can be a a really, really helpful way of finding the path when you're in that in-between space, you know, where you're really not sure what you need to be doing or where you need to be going, but you can tell that this message is an insight and that message is a fear and mm -hmm. that then, you know, then you know which one to follow, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes it can be slightly tricky because I have had times where, and, and maybe there's a subtle difference that I'm not tuned into yet, but... There are times where I'm going to try something new and I am kind of scared of it or there's some anxiety around it, but I try it anyways and it turns out to be actually great. So maybe it's just that there's some subtle difference in the initial call to a thing or something. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think, you know, you really just said it yourself. Um, you feel the fear, but you know what you need to do, right? Mm, yeah, interesting. So what other kind of things are, are going on right now that are interesting to you? Uh, what other things? Let me see. Um, what have you guys been talking about on the show lately? I haven't tuned in in a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I guess um, we've, been, we've been looking at a few different things. Let me think about for a second about mm -hmm. what we did just recently. Um, uh uh, yeah, we were talking about, most recently we were talking about leadership and how leadership is changing. So we spoke a little bit about our current political leadership in particular around the world and the, the older value sets that are driving that mm. and uh, its tendency to want to hang on to, you know, the old systems and, and resist change and then emerging new leadership and how that's shifting you know where and most immediately we're kind of shifting from a a profit based leadership you know which is all about doing the best thing for yourself and making the best profits that we can and and often our leaders are, are kind of under what i call corporate capture where they're you know subject to financial funding from corporates that shapes the, the decisions that they make mm -hmm. uh, and um, and we're shifting from that into a much more humanistic form of leadership where human values and human experience become our central reference point. Mm. And, uh, and you can see that, you know, starting to come through in mainstream politics, but our mainstream political systems are really still operating in many ways according to the old agricultural paradigm, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think they've been kept there largely because having older systems makes them easier to manipulate. Mm. You know? If the system is a simple system, then it's pretty easy to to uh, run rings around it and use it, you know, to your own purposes. And that's what the scientific industrial era politicians have done: is they've tried to keep the system simple so they can still control them. Um, and so, what that means is it's it's we're going to reach a point where it's pretty much impossible to actually bring these older systems up to date, and they'll need to be superseded by something completely new. Mm -hmm. We're going to see a lot of that over the next decade or so. Uh, and a lot of it might not be conscious change. A lot of it might be simply that someone comes up with a much better way of doing things and it actually works and people naturally gravitate to using that new system and just let the old system die in the background, you know. That's kind of nice when that can happen. Yeah. An example of that already happening is a move to uh, renewable energy generation, for example. So I know here in Australia, just as an example, there are so many people that have put rooftop uh, solar systems on their houses now. 
mm-hmm. that it really is changing the the old energy market quite significantly. Mm. Uh, and this is just something that people have done individually because their values have led them to to do that. You know, that's that's how they want to be creating energy. Uh, and the old system hasn't really stayed on top of the change and now it's getting kind of blindsided by oh wait hang on a minute you know not as many people are buying our coal-fired yeah. power mm-hmm. you know yeah. and then that that makes the their prices go up and they go into like a death spiral basically so we'll see that happening across a whole bunch of different systems including i think our political systems and our economic systems yeah yeah i was going to say it seems like you can notice the same thing with like diet and health and wellness you know more uh, co-ops and are around this in the city I live in more co-ops pop up and they're expanding and getting bigger and people want local produce and you know there's more sauna yoga studios well you know all these different things it's just the demand seems to be uh, increasing yeah yeah absolutely uh, and then uh, the discussion we had before about you know getting in touch with your intuition and not operating from fear i mean it's of course it's extremely relevant to leadership as well and yeah. uh we'll look for leaders that aren't operating out of fear and and even some of the leading edge public discussions at the moment like climate change for example is still massively driven by fear yeah uh, and, and that's actually getting in the way of finding solutions uh, mm-hmm. and how close of attention do you pay to the U.S. political situation right now? Uh, look, I'm I keep an eye on it. You know, I'm, I don't uh, study it for hours and hours, but sure. I, I just try and keep an overview of, of where it's at and what's going on. Like, uh, you know, I understand the impeachment uh, investigation is underway, and um, I was yeah. asking. Uh, I'm curious what you think of not necessarily him as a candidate per se, but some of the ideas of uh, a guy like Andrew Yang. It's sort of an interesting, um, some of the, it seems like some of the things he's bringing up are uh, less fear-based and more humanitarian in some ways and and just sort of um, a little more forward thinking than what I'm used to seeing from political people. Yeah, that's good to see. I mean, I, I haven't, studied Andrew Yang. I know his name, you know, I've heard his name mentioned, but I, yeah. I, I can't comment because I haven't really studied him closely at all. But, sure. but uh, those things that you, you're mentioning, you know, they're the things to be looking for, looking for uh, people who are thinking longer term. And this is a phenomenon that relates to the individual versus the communal paradigms. And when we go through individually oriented layers, we typically think short term and the communal uh, layers of consciousness typically think longer term. Mm. Uh, and so that long-term thinking is evidence, uh, you know, I mean, if it's forward thinking and yeah. you're not going backwards to agricultural thinking, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's, it's an example of somebody who is, yeah, potentially operating from the next paradigm and uh, uh, people operating without being driven by fear. I think that's a, a real thing to look for, for sure, yeah. That reminds me of uh, something I was kind of thinking about the um so the tier uh layer seven which is the first uh layer in tier two that's back to an individualistic uh layer right uh yeah so layer seven first step into the second tier is yeah. individually oriented except it's kind of like a different ball game once you get into the second tier because we get uh, equal access to both brain hemispheres. So in the first tier of consciousness, as we've gone through the different layers, we've been swapping from uh, left hemisphere to right hemisphere to left hemisphere to right hemisphere. Mm. And the the left hemisphere is masculine individual. The right hemisphere is feminine communal, just in terms of general themes. So we've just we're just coming to the end of the scientific industrial being a left brain masculine individual themed uh, paradigm hence the moving patriarchy back talk and yeah, all that. exactly and, and the rise of the awareness of the feminine as the sixth layer you know is bringing the right brain right, right brain awareness back yeah um, but at layer seven in second tier we get both at once and so it is it does have a leaning towards individual operation 
Um, however, it's much, much more balanced than any individual paradigm has ever been before. So how would you, how do you think of the individual uh, sort of orientation of it or what does that look like in your eyes? I've heard it explained sort of in a way, I mean, is it sort of like a, because another thing that I've been getting into are ideas about um, sort of like individuation and sort of um, things where being enmeshed with like family members and codependency and there's sort of this movement towards kind of like really being solid within yourself and like solid as an individual and feeling like yeah. you can support yourself. And do you see that? Is that sort of like um, what the individual aspect of like a, a layer seven is like to some extent? Yeah, I think so. I do think so. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that happens during this transition is uh, if you think about layer seven as being like a, the first baby step in the second tier, right? Mm -hmm. And it kind of equates to our hunter gatherer existence in first tier, where, which was our first baby step into being human. And it's, it's kind of uh, definitely human, but it's still, you know, got a lot of sort of animalistic characteristics to it from our previous existence. And so uh, layer seven, the first step into second tier, it's definitely second tier, but it's still somewhat rationally minded in the way that it thinks and, and operates. Uh, as opposed to being transrational, which is operating purely from this deeper intuitive space. Mm. Uh, so it's still kind of logically trying to figure stuff out, but it has this multidimensional awareness. And uh, we get this, uh, what I call disentanglement from all of the encumbrances of the first tier. So mm. as we grow through the first tier, you know, we've got our got our survival issues, we've got our family issues, we've got our personal power issues, we've got our duties, you know, the things that we really should be doing uh, to be a righteous citizen. We've got our personal success in the scientific industrial paradigm. And then we've got our um, embedded uh, position in community in the sixth layer, which is just emerging for many people and, you know, being liked and supported by our wider network. And all of those things, by the, by the time you get to the, the sixth layer, you know, you've got those six loads that you're carrying mm -hmm. your shoulders. And this is what leads to overwhelm, you know. Uh, and that's part of the evolutionary tension required to kick us over into second tier. So when we get into second tier, all of that stuff just drops away. And the space, the psychological space that emerges is why second tier has more coping capacity than anything that's come before. Uh, because all of a sudden, all of the weight that we were carrying from all of those different things just isn't there anymore. And so it's a, it's a great sense of freedom and the, the additional you know, computational or coping capacity is, is off the charts. That makes a yeah. lot of sense. So that's maybe why... Uh, uh a state a layer seven a tier two person might feel pretty comfortable within themselves as an individual and yes. be able to move forward from that space with more freedom to kind of go where they're needed or whatever yeah that, that's very true um some people interpret uh layer seven folks as being a bit cold and detached as well mm -hmm. um and I don't think that's an accurate interpretation, but it can look that way because they're not, they don't get tossed around by all of these issues that I just mentioned, you know, yep. uh, and they don't have the extreme emotional responses that other people might have because they're just, they, they have that freedom. Yeah, right. Where that might upset people that are used to having the dynamic of I get upset and you get upset back and we get yeah. into a thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Um, one other thing that I had written down a, quite a while back, and I see it here, and it's kind of interesting to me. Um, I think I was listening to one of your shows once, and I thought of this. Um, I was wondering if like fears and misunderstandings can come from sort of projecting old paradigm onto uh, into the future and sort of projecting it over the top of things that are emerging from the new paradigm. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a really common thing. Uh, even futurists, you know, people, because people can't see into the future, they usually can't imagine new technologies that haven't been invented yet. 
and if you look back in time, you know, if if somebody was back in 1940 thinking about what the world's going to be like in the future, all they've got to reference is what's around in 1940, you know. And if you think about, okay, how are we going to cope when the population on the planet doubles and all, all we've got is what we have now? It's not going to work. Well, of course it's not going to work. Um, mm -hmm. What they miss out on factoring is, is all the new technologies that have developed since then, by the time the population does double, then, hey, we've got much more efficient ways of living and you know much better technologies. So it's really, really common for people to um, be fearful around that and to project their fears into the future, absolutely. And it's, I mean, it's happening right now with the global warming thing, right? Um, people are seeing that the climate's not right and the, even the scientists are predicting a linear warning tre a warming trend that's going to you know, go to the end of the century. Uh, and if you look at the history of uh, climate, it's never been linear, ever. You know, it looks more like the stock market charts. Uh, hmm. and, and so there's a, an awful lot of fear driving discussion around change at the moment and particularly climate. It's, it's, uh, in my opinion, the fear is actually disrupting the science quite badly. And so um, people are basing scientific studies on assumptions based on fear, not fact, mm -hmm. and, and producing some really wacky science. You know, I saw one study a while back where some scientists had just working on the assumption that, okay, these other assumptions are right and we're just going to get hotter for the next 100 years. Uh, then that means that the ocean's going to change color, you know? Mm -hmm. So they actually published a peer-reviewed paper saying the ocean was going to change color by the end of the century. And it's, you know, it, it's uh, got no factual basis to it at all. It's just based on assumptions. And we've got to the point now, though, where a lot of our science isn't science as it used to be. Like, for example, the predictions from the United Nations IPCC around climate change are mostly based on computer models. And com computer models are not reality. Mm -hmm. They're they're dependent upon whoever programmed the computer model, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you look at the history of their predictions, they are mostly wrong. Uh, and that's why, because they're not connected to reality. So it's a very interesting time. From well, the, the weather always seems to be pretty inaccurate a week out, much less <laughs> years in advance. Uh, I've been watching the weather really closely here because I've had a bushfire about three miles away from my house, a forest fire. Uh, and I noticed that the, the temperature forecast 24 hours ahead was way, way wrong. Mm. Like the, you know, the, the forecast temperature was much, much higher than the actual temperature was on the day. And if we can't forecast the weather 24 hours in advance accurately, then how the hell can we forecast climate 30 years in advance? You know, it's just not possible at the moment. Yeah, I was just listening to an interview last night. Um... Charles Eisenstein was on Russell Brand's podcast, and uh, he was talking about, uh, they kind of brought up the idea of people talk about how we're addicted to oil and we're addicted to fossil fuels and all of this. And Charles had an interesting point of, you know, so the fear and the shame around, uh, around that, you know, the climate change is tending to put a lot of like shame and fear and guilt on people yeah. for using yeah. fossil fuels and all this stuff is like, when has that worked to, uh, for addictions, you know, and for addicts to guilt exactly. and fear and shame them. So yeah, yeah. It's kind of proposing that, you know, there's going to be need to be more of a shift where people actually just care about the planet as a living thing and, you know, want to support it and, and that. Of course. Yeah. And, and that's coded into the evolutionary change that's happening to us. You know, the, all we need to do is to support that shift and, and maybe even accelerate it, you know, with the technologies we have, which we know can accelerate shifts in consciousness. Uh, yeah. So before we wrap up, I would be curious to hear a little bit more if you uh, want to share about kind of what your, what your own research has been kind of telling you about the climate projections. You know sure. what your t take on the whole thing is. Yeah, uh, I'll issue a trigger warning. It's not mainstream. Right? Yeah, it doesn't doesn't fit with the mainstream narrative. So, what I've been doing is uh, I've used. Using... But you're not, you're not funded by oil executives, and you're uh, not I, a I, Trump I promise, supporter. <laughs> I promise I'm not funded by oil executives. Mm -hmm. um, what I've been doing is taking my knowledge of Claire Graves's map of consciousness and particularly the capacity to analyze language using his reference map 
and then looking for sources of information that are the most conscious that I can find, right? And by analyzing their language, looking for things like whether what they're saying is fear driven or not, just mm. as an example. And what I'm finding is that there's this phenomenon which has happened during the scientific industrial era where we've gone really, really deep with our knowledge about very, very narrow areas. And this has resulted in in the specialist mentality of the that era, right? Where you have specialist doctors that know everything there is to know about a tiny, tiny, narrow part of the body. Um, you know, they might know about bones and you, and you go to them and ask them about something else and they say, oh, I don't know about that. You're going to go talk to someone else, you know. <laughs> Uh, and that same phenomenon applies right across society. So um, science, you know, right across the board has really, really narrow knowledge in certain areas, but has lost the understanding of how those different areas are connected. And that's why the pendulum is now swinging back the other way. And the emerging paradigm is very much about networking and connecting information and getting a, an understanding of how the whole system works rather than just one narrow part. And that same issue is affecting climate change because there's been this idea developed during the previous era of what a climate scientist ought to study. And it doesn't include a whole lot of things which are potentially impacting climate on the planet. And the most obvious uh, and important is the sun, right? And so if you want to know about what the sun does, don't go and talk to a climate scientist because they've got no idea. All they'll say to you is, oh, we've measured the radiative heat and that's not very much, so we don't worry about it, you know? Mm -hmm. But if you go talk to an astrophysicist uh, about the sun, you'll get a completely different story. And I've been looking particularly at the work of Dr. Valentina Zarkova, who's uh, based in the UK. She's a, a mathematician and a astrophysicist and has done an extensive study of solar dynamics, which builds upon previous similar studies by other astrophysicists. And uh, she's, she's made a, a map of how the solar dynamics impact uh, terrestrial climate. And she's reverse engineered that for a couple of thousand years and found that the variations in the sun's dynamics show up in changes to earthly climate. And so uh, she is predicting that we're headed into a, a mini ice age, which is really going to hit home by about 2032, which is, that's interesting because that's a date that I've uh, identified as a, as a turning point. And she's actually warning that by 2028, we're going to have such severe food shortages globally that we really need to start preparing for it now. Otherwise, you know, a lot of people are going to suffer from that. Uh, and um, apart from her work, there's some, a lot of other good work out there. Uh, and I can provide some links if you want. Yeah. Uh, where people are looking at really sophisticated understandings of, for example, magnetic fields that emerge from the sun uh, and then go all the way to Earth and uh, cause magnetic disturbances on Earth, which can generate large storms and those sorts of things. Um, another aspect is space weather generally, so cosmic ray impact uh, and there was a, a wonderful piece of work that I came across from a, a Danish uh, scientist who studied how uh, cosmic rays entering our atmosphere can cause uh, cloud cover. And when the sun goes through a solar minimum, which it is at the moment, in fact, where it's heading, just starting what they call a grand solar minimum, which is a three or 400 year in cycle, um, the solar wind dies back and that normally protects us from cosmic ray impact. So we got more cosmic rays coming through and penetrating our atmosphere, which according to this Danish study will generate increased cloud cover, which is going to cool the planet down. Mm. So there's a very, very consistent message on getting from outside of climate science yep. that we ought to be preparing for cooling, not warming. Uh, and then having discovered that over the last few years I've, I've scratched my head and, and thought okay well why are so many people really pushing this global warming thing and then um, I'm, I'm still in the process of, of investigating that but I, I think there are some pretty significant agendas sitting behind that push which are not visible to most people uh, and one of them is uh, a push to empower the United Nations uh, and this is why we're we're hearing most of the 
accusations from the UN and the IPCC, I think, is because they they would like to think that they're the only organisation that can solve this problem for us. Mm, interesting. That, yeah. that ultimately means reducing the power of national governments and increasing the power of the United Nations. Mm. So it's very, very complex. It's made even more complex by the fact that the evolutionary shift that our consciousness is going through right now is leading people to take more notice of the planet, to want to care for the planet and to resolve the problems that we've created ecologically, you know, during the scientific industrial era. And that's a natural tendency. And uh, the, the kind of folks who would push their global power agendas are well and truly aware of that natural tendency. And it's kind of like they're just tagging along uh, and, you know, let's just, uh, this is already moving in that direction. Let's just give it a little shove and see if we can get some benefit out of it, if that mm. makes sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, are, is, do you look at Ben Davidson's work? Uh, no, I'm not the sure. Suspicious mm. Observer, I think is his. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't know him by that name, but yeah. Um, in fact, it was his YouTube channel, which published a really good short documentary about solar dynamics recently, which I shared. Uh, which is definitely worth a look and it's difficult with some of this stuff because uh, some of the the science is so technical you can kind of get lost in it but uh, mm. that particular one was was fairly good yeah um, and again you know I'm I'm really careful about analyzing the sources and some information coming through some of these sources it's not their information but they're passing it on and sometimes the people who are passing it on uh, are a bit all over the shop you know and maybe yeah the best source to be getting all your information from but if you go back trace it back to the original source then you know that's what i'm trying to yeah. yeah um it's interesting what you said about the analyzing the language uh what did you say that was based off of again so uh in claire graves's work he mapped these different layers of consciousness and he yep. identified particular values a particular worldview yep. and some really deep underlying uh, drivers of behavior and so you can use that information to look at language and I've got to the point of being pretty good at it now where sometimes within listening to a few sentences from somebody I can start to get a sense of which particular value system they're operating from as their dominant value system mm. and once I know which dominant value system is at play I can tell you uh, quite likely what their blind spots are going to be um, I can tell you what the shadow aspect of their personality will probably Interesting. be. Interesting. Uh, I can tell you what their compulsive behaviors will probably be. So it's very, very, you know, deep analysis. Yeah. Do you feel like you could analyze me? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of just. I'd love to hear help, it. I'd help myself now. Uh, yeah. you know, I've been using this model for so long. As soon as I start talking to somebody, I, I'm your words are painting a picture in my mind of where you sit on that spiral. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to hear that if you'd be willing to tell me. Yeah, well, you you told me yourself basically. You, you know, you told me what you told me was that you're still navigating a lot of the dynamics of healing within the sixth layer of consciousness, but you're also having glimpses of these things which you think might be second tier. And, and you're right, what you said is correct. Yeah, so you know, you, you told me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Interesting. I, I can verify, you know, I can verify from your behavior, your language, that that fits. You, what, you, what you said seems to be an accurate assessment. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Um, it seems like there could be, I'm just thinking like, I feel like there should be some sort of spiral dynamics app or something. I don't know yeah. what, I don't know what exactly it would do, but it just. Look, it, it's, it's something I've thought of. And uh, if I had some funding, uh, I would, I could absolutely do that. I, I've just finished uh, reviewing and writing a foreword for a new book based on Claire Graves' work called mm. The Change Code. And uh, it's being published by a lady uh, called Monica Bourgeau from Portland, Oregon. Mm. And Monica reached out to me early this year and I've been working uh, with her for a few months to, uh, to put the finishing touches on the book and, and write the foreword for the book. So that I think is planned to be published uh, before the end of the year and I can certainly let you know when that comes out, yeah. Yeah, yeah I feel like I've actually heard of that. Yeah, maybe you have, yeah. Are you doing any talks or anything soon? Or um, I just did one at a, a festival here called Rebel Herbal, uh, which I mentioned. Um, I've got one scheduled at Rainbow Serpent Festival, which is a big music festival that happens in Victoria in January. 
Mm. That's my next scheduled talk, yeah. Cool. And then, um, obviously, you're still doing the radio show every week. Yeah, still doing the Future Sense podcast every yep. week. Okay. Uh, my my good buddy and uh, and partner in crime, Mitch Schultz, is uh, coming back over here in January. So Mitch and I are making plans to shoot a Future Sense documentary, uh, which at this stage is looking like it's going to be probably an eight or nine piece uh, documentary series where we'll talk about all this stuff and we're going to travel around the world and film places where people are ahead of the the game in terms of uh, building the future society, you know, and having new technologies and those sorts of things and, and just get the word out there as, as best as we can about the, the change dynamic, you know, the profile, which everybody would really benefit from understanding uh, as we've been discussing. Yeah. So um, we're, we're waiting on some funding for that, but uh, all going well, we're, we ought to start shooting that probably next year. Yeah. That's exciting. That'll be really yeah. cool. Um, Anything else you want to share or um, want people to check out or anything? Uh, I guess um, people can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my ID is at stevemc1. Mm-hmm. Uh, figure one, that is. Um, but if you, if you go to my blog, emanate.net, E-M-A-N, number eight dot net, then links are there to uh my twitter and, and other social media and anything i come across i usually push it out on twitter pretty quickly uh, we uh i think i last time i spoke to you i mentioned the foundation that i've created now uh the Artie mesh foundation which is a a uh, charity basically a non-profit change agency and all my future work is is being done through that um and uh where We've had a, a pretty good year this year in terms of uh, people coming on board to support us, and we've got some uh, promised funding in the pipeline now, which all going well will allow us to get out and start shooting this documentary series next year. Awesome. And, uh, and we have future plans to build a web platform where people can find each other to uh, to you know work together around the challenges, the global challenges that we're creating as nice. well, and uh, and also plans to uh, establish a. A physical center, like a, a center where we can deploy some of these advanced healing healing technologies and things here. Yeah. yeah, that seems like a prominent thing that's starting to pop up is people feeling the desire to create centers of, of yeah that kind for people to connect and heal and all that. So yeah, absolutely it is. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Jacob. Really appreciate the opportunity to to have a chat again. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we'll have to do it uh, sooner than last time. I think. Yeah. Okay. If you're up for it. Yeah. Up for it. Yeah. Just, just let me know. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day out there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's um, still smoky here, but it seems like the the worst of the fire threat has passed now. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Cool. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good one. Catch you soon. Cheers. Bye, Steve.